Good to see everyone tonight. I know we had a few technical difficulties working it out. We do have just a little bit of a different service tonight. Um, Lisa is under the weather and uh, with uh, family um, emergencies also, and so we're going to do some uh, things a little bit different. Once in a while, it's good to just kind of shake things up and um, surprise you, and so you just get me the whole night. So, uh, <laughs> and the doors are closed, so you can't leave. So there you go. So. But it's good to see we have some, uh, some guests with us tonight and some folks that we've uh, been with us in the past, and it's good to have them back. And uh, it's just good to come together. I, I really appreciate uh, this last week. I was met, talking with someone, and they just shared how significant Wednesday night is for them just to um, come together, uh, that break in the middle of the week. Uh, we just have a chance to get together and get refreshed um, together with God's presence, um, be able to get stirred by God's Word, and um, just to be able to get together and to see one another um, as the, the week goes on. I know, again, we're praying for, um, for Judy and um, with uh, the, the funeral service tomorrow for her husband. Um, others of you have had um, crisis in your families, um, Lisa's nephew passing away, and others have had um, storms have hit your home, you know, some of them spiritual, some of them physical. Um, but it's good for us just to come together and to, in a sense, uh, regroup uh, as a group and to be able to care one for another. So why don't we just pray? We'll get right into uh, what, what the Lord wants to do tonight. He's always present with us. He's not impressed with our singing, um, but he, uh, uh, one of the greatest forms of worship that we can have is when we surrender to his word and his will for our life. And so, Father God, we just thank you that you are a present help in time of need. And Lord, all of us in this room would say that we have needs in our life. Lord, uh, some of them may be uh, more urgent than others. Some of them may seem more, uh, more of a catastrophe than others. But, Lord, we would have to say every day we need you. And so we just thank you that you are present with us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who teaches us the, the living word of God, the promises that you give to us um, to be a shield of faith and to be also to be a sword of the Spirit in our life as we speak out your word. We're asking that you continue to, um, to speak to every soul on this campus as we come together, every student, every youth, every child, every baby, that the Holy Spirit would speak. If, if John the Baptist could leap within the womb of his mother, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here with us today. And in our gathering, the Spirit of the Lord is able to, to stir within us. We open ourselves up to... Uh, to any and all of your words of encouragement, manifestations of your spirit. And um, we just open ourselves up to the, the freedom of what you want to accomplish. And we just make sure that we don't have any just religious uh, rituals in place that would hinder the flow of your spirit and a demonstration of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, I was just thinking on, <clears throat> on that this morning, maybe share a little bit more uh, this coming Sunday. Um, there was incredible destiny that was inside of uh, Mary and inside of, Mel of Elizabeth, her, her cousin. John was, one was carrying John the Baptist, and one was carrying Jesus the Messiah. And when they got close to each other, John the Baptist leaps within his mother's womb. I, I don't know if I can say this in real short and then without really, like I said, I might share more on Sunday. We need to get around people that causes the things of God to leap within us. We need to be around people that just don't tick you off and get you mad and get you all fired up on the inside. But we need to be around people that God's doing something in them and doing something in us. And when we get together, we realize that he's doing something in, in all of us together. And that there is a leaping, there's an, an excitement, there's an, a, a presence um, and a reality of what God is, is bringing us together to do. There was two seeds that were in two wombs that were going to work together to, to make an, a, a difference in humanity. And it's important for us as believers to understand that it's not just about me, but it's about what God's put in me to accomplish and to do that is going to make an, a difference in other people's lives. And God always works with, there's always an us. Um, there's, we, we come together. And so oftentimes, the vision, the the dreams, the desires that God puts on the inside of us that, that we, we never you know, think, where would that come from? Why, why, would, why would I even think that? And if we're not around other people that, 
have, this, have God moving in their lives, oftentimes that, that dream just kind of sits there and goes cold. But when we get around other believers that God's doing something in their life also, there's a leaping on the inside of us. Amen? And so I'm just thankful that when I'm around you that there's stuff leaping on the inside of me and what God wants to accomplish and God, what God wants to fulfill in and our, through our lives. And oftentimes, and I've mentioned this and I want to say thank you, it's, it's um, after a service, after I've preached and um, shared the word of the Lord and there would be someone come up and say, God shared this with me during your sermon or these scriptures that came alive to me during this time or someone will come up later in the week and, and say, this happened to me just like you were talking about Sunday morning. And that's not to put any kind of uh, pride or anything in my life. Um, I'm just a spokesman, you understand. Um, I'm just saying what I hear the Father say or the Spirit speaking through me. And so it's always exciting to be able to be around someone that comes up and says, hey, God did this in my life and it connected with what God was saying in your life. And it's a leaping on the inside of me and encouragement on the inside. And so, uh, so let's just expect some more of that going on in our lives. Amen. And tonight, as I said, we, we don't have our uh, normal... Uh, regular praise and worship gives us a little bit more time and so I asked Kimberly to come and to be able to, to share a testimony. Remember last Sunday we shared on how to have a larger harvest. We need to increase the harvest with expectation. We need to stretch. Turn your neighbor and say you need to stretch. You need to stretch. You need to stretch. Come on up Kimberly. You need to stretch and the week before that we talked about power evangelism that it's not just telling someone um, a ritual or not just joining a church, but it is the power of the gospel that transforms and changes lives. And that opens us up to the gifts of the Spirit and how God wants to move supernaturally in our lives in a, in a powerful way if we'll allow Him to. And so, um, and then we talked about how many have been doing your alarm, getting your alarm set at 1038 and 208, remember? 1038, we set the alarm at 1038 because Matthew 1038 just hang still for a minute. Um, 1038 is where Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth or thrust labors out into the harvest. The harvest is plenteous. The labors are few. We don't need to pray for harvest. We need to pray for harvesters. Amen. And so, and then we've seen in Psalm 28, Psalm 28, it says that ask of me the heathen as thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth as thy possession. And so we're praying at 1038 and 208. Um, I suggest you do 10.38 in the morning and 2.08 in the afternoon. You can flip that if you want to, but um, please just be praying and believing God for what he wants to accomplish and to do. If my people who are called by my name will, will, will pray, what happens if my people who are called by my name don't pray? Huh? Then things don't happen. So we're going to be people of prayer so we can see God move supernaturally. And so, um, so just share um, the... You know, the, the story, the testimony of how God used you. Okay. Uh, uh, keep that microphone up close okay. to you there. Okay. Well, um, so Sunday morning in our, um, at 9 o'clock, we have like a discipleship slash prayer group. All right. looks like I don't have a sound man. Is it on? And so you're just going to have to just talk, loud. just talk, talk loud. Can you guys hear me? No. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know what happened to my <laughs> pre-rapture case here. So, okay. okay, go ahead. So. Okay. Woo. Um, so uh, last Sunday at, in our nine o'clock group we have over there and everybody's invited, it's sort of a discipleship slash prayer group. Um, we were talking about evangelism in there and it was almost exactly what pastor preached sermon Sunday and we really didn't know exactly that's what was going to happen, but it's Holy Spirit. So I know that, um, that this evangelism ordeal is um, really on the Father's heart and um, you know, in the Bible, it says, do the work of the evangelist for all of us to do the work of the evangelist. And I think sometimes we make it too hard on ourselves and we think, oh, I have to be at a certain place or have certain words or whatever. And it's, it's really just um, taking the time and um, like instead of going through the drive through somewhere, like actually go in the restaurant, go in and just see if God highlights somebody to you. Or if, um, an easy one, if somebody has a, if a crutch, crutches or a cane, you can ask them if they want prayer for healing or, you know, I don't know. But um, so anyway, Sunday after church, I was uh, driving to my mom's for Mother's Day. And I, did, I felt led to pull into this gas station that I never go to. I Maybe five years ago I was at this gas station. But it was almost like my car, like I had to go in this gas station. And I didn't need anything in there, so I just got out and went in and... Um, 
and it was like, like time stood still. I mean, it was, it was, it was crazy. Like God kept back all the other customers. And there was people in the parking lot when I got there, but like nobody, nobody came in. And um, so it gave me time to talk to the checkout girl. And I'm just like, oh, hi, how you doing? You know, you know, God loves you, whatever. And this girl just starts telling me stuff about her life and about how she's in an abusive relationship and she's trapped. And um, I tried to give her my phone number and she's like, oh, he took my phone. I can't even call you, blah, blah. Uh, um, and you know, when somebody just starts telling you personal information about themselves, that there's really no reason why they're telling you that. You, you know, I always know, okay, God, this is something, you're working in this situation, God. And so I just let her talk and um, the situation's, you know, it's, it's pretty bad. I tried to tell her about Quinata and different things um, to get out of it, but like most w women in abusive relationships, they have a million reasons why they think they need to stay. So anyway, um, I'm not gonna say this young lady's name, but if you guys would all just lift her up in prayer that she can get out of this relationship and that the abuser would get saved, that's my prayer. Um, but so I asked her, um, can I pray with you? And since there was no other customers in there, it was so awesome. She's like, yeah, okay. And I took her hands and um, just pr like, and I, when I asked her if she knew God loved her, she just kind of looked at me and she's like, eh, I don't, I don't trust this God thing. I don't, I don't trust him. I don't know. And so I just, so I prayed real simple for God to reveal himself to her and for her to experience the heart of the father. And, um, and then the Holy Spirit told me to pray for her to, for, um, to break off rejection and abandonment and shame off her life. And she just, it just broke. She just started weeping and weeping and like tightening her grip on my hands and weeping. And um, I, when I got done praying with her, I'm like, you know, what's going on? And she's like, how would you know? How would you know to pray that? She said, I was sexually abused as a baby. And I was then, when I brought it up to my family, I was rejected, like, you know, a few years later, they kicked her out of the family and totally rejected because of it. And so. So it was cool. So she knew that God was like there because there's no way I would have known to pray that for her. And um, so it ended up just being a really beautiful thing and we hugged and um, I did give her my name and number and she actually reached out to me on Messenger a couple days ago. And so that's super, super cool. So I hope someday she'll come to church. And, but it was just, you know, just taking the time just to stop when I felt like God wanted me to stop there. It's really that simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Good job. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> So I simply wanted to share that with you. I mean, I, I get the chance to hear all these wonderful stories and testimonies, and then we kind of wonder, you know, um, if anything's really happening. And I want you to know that, that God is moving, um, but he needs people to move through. And, and so it is that simple of just being um, open and re receptive to him, and maybe it is going into a gas station, and, well, what if I go in there and uh, nothing happens? Well, you haven't lost a lot, but you, you've, you've, but you are open and you're receptive for that situation. Uh, we don't need to know that individual's name right now, but I think that the Holy Spirit does. Could we just pause and just pray for her and then just also for us that we'll be just more usable by the power of the Holy Spirit? Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you are a loving Heavenly Father. Thank you that you love every one of us just exactly the same that there's no one that you love more and there's no one that you love less. And so we just ask that the love of the Father would be revealed to this woman in an ever-increasing way, that the, the words that were spoken would just be brought back, but the moment would be brought back to her and that she, dear God, would just continue to reach out to know you. Lord, we're asking that you would use us. Use us, Father, not just to try to get more people to come to church, but for people to get to know you for people to be able to be liberated in their life, for people to be able to, be, uh, to be, uh, experience the goodness of God and your grace that transforms and changes life. And so we just open ourselves up, Lord, to be the answer to the prayers that we've been praying. Lord, send us forth as labors into the harvest. May there be a sense of urgency that's within our hearts to reach people to take the time to, to care for others, to be able to have eyes that open to see the needs of those that are hurting around us and need to see Jesus in their life. We're asking for the heathen as our inheritance. Lord, we use that word with no disrespect. They just don't know you. And so we're asking, Father, for opportunities to make you known in our community and, and, uh, and people that we come across. 
And may it be done in a way that is empowered by the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so we just give ourselves afresh to you. Thank you, Lord, for opening it. Lord, thank you for your blessing upon, uh, upon Kimberly, Lord, for being willing to be used of you. Thank you for your health in her physical body. Thank you, Father God, for clarity in, in her spirit to be able to know you. And we just thank you, Lord, that you're going to continue to use her in, in the gift of the evangelist for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is working. God, God is working. God's working. He's working in our lives and wants to transform and to change us. And um, tonight's message that I have, I want to I share with us from a perspective that maybe times we don't, we don't talk about or think about um, as much as we probably should, especially in our country. And um, Paul is writing to Timothy and giving him some instructions as a pastor. And in just a minute, we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. And so if you want to get your Bible out, if you've got it, or I'll read the scriptures. I'm going to do some different translations. You can listen if you want to, or maybe just jot down these, these verses, and you can look them up later. Um, but I would ask you, listen to the, what the Holy Spirit speaks to you tonight. Don't just get information from the preacher. Uh, get, a, get a word from, from the Holy Spirit that he's speaking to you about. I could give you eight pages of information, but there's probably one, one word that God wants to plant on the inside of you. One word that he maybe wants to water and bring alive afresh on the inside of you tonight. And I just want you to be, to be extra sensitive that there's no test at the end, so you don't have to memorize everything. But just have a listening heart. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Because um, I, I want us as a church to be fully engulfed with the presence of the Lord so that we can be used of the Lord in the day in which we are part of. I want to speak to us for a few moments about that empty feeling when you're full. That empty feeling when you're full. I'd mentioned it in just the illustration in prayer on Monday, and it just really kind of caught me, where, and it seems to be one that most could relate with. Have you ever gone to the refrigerator when you're, you're hungry, and you look through it, and there's, there's really... It's full, but there's nothing there, you know, and then you come back five minutes later and you think that the refrigerator fairy, maybe he's put something new or different in it, that maybe the apples that are in the crisper all of a sudden have been made into a pie or something like that has happened and you go back again and you look and same stuff there and, and, and nothing, so you just start munching on stuff, you start grazing through the kitchen, you know, and, and then by an hour later and the bag of chips are gone, and, and this is gone, and the soda's gone, and, and you're full, but you still have that empty feeling because you weren't really satisfied. And I sense that there is a lot of Christians in our nation that, that have a regular fill-up, but there's an emptiness, a contentment that's on the inside of them. Maybe I'll just ask you, do you know Christians, any Christians that are discontent, that they, they, they just not have a sense of contentment in their life. And folks, we're in a, in a, in a nation that is one of the most wealthy nations of the world. Uh, most of us, compared to the rest of the world, um, have incredible resources. Uh, we have the opportunity to, to make um, money. We have the opportunity to oftentimes to maybe uh, own our own home or buy our own car or do some of these things. We as Americans have the, right now anyway, the privilege of being able to gather on Wednesday night for church if you feel like it um, or want to come out. And we've got Sunday morning and some of these things that we have some freedom. And yet I see so many Christians that have so many blessings in their life. They keep grazing through the refrigerator, but there's still an emptiness on the inside of them. And here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7, the Amplified Translation says it this way, but godliness actually is a source of great gain when accompanied by contentment. Could you say contentment? Contentment. <laughs> Contentment's a good thing. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I like the Amplified because it goes on here and it, it kind of defines, it explains, and, and I hope tonight a little bit refines us a little bit in this area of realizing just this contentment that needs to be in our life. Let me start over. It says, but godliness actually is a source of great gain when accompanied by contentment, 
that contentment which comes from a sense of inner confidence based on the sufficiency of God. A contentment that comes, which comes from a sense of inner confidence, an inner confidence based on the sufficiency of God. You see, I'm sure most of us in the room could probably quote some scriptures on how God can meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He meets all of my needs. We could read read many of those scriptures. We know that from the Old Testament that it was God's covenant with um, with Abraham, that he was going to bless Abraham, that he was going to be uh, a blessed man and all of those that would follow after him, that this covenant that would be uh, an eternal covenant that would be upon him and that all of those that would be a part of the seed of Abraham would be blessed along the way. We see someone like Job in the Bible that was the wealthiest man in all of the, of the East that was there. Um, and, and then God returned back uh, several times over that which was taken from him. God has no problem with blessing us. But folks, real contentment doesn't come from the amount of money that we have in the bank or the car that we have in, in the garage. Um, it doesn't come from the outward things. It comes from an inner confidence that we have our sufficiency is in God. And we've got to grab a hold of that in our lives, folks. We've got to grab a hold of that God is with us, He is for us, and He will supply in our life. Because when we have that kind of confidence, then we don't allow the natural limitations that are around us to keep us from doing what God's put on the inside of us. I hear Christians complaining about their lives. I don't feel happy or successful. I don't have what other people have that would make me feel content. I don't understand why God won't give me more or do more in my life. Contentment. It's like they're looking for more out here to give them a sense of fulfillment in here. And it's backwards. We're supposed to have an inner confidence in God's sufficiency. Folks, that's where it's, I would rather have wisdom than wealth. Because wisdom says, regardless of where you're at or what you're facing, there's an almighty God that is able to meet your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Wealth says, this is how much you got, and if you spend more than that, then you're just out of luck. And tonight, I just want to remind us, remind us as a church, that we've got to have this confidence on the inside of us. Because God's going to ask great things of us. Things that are beyond our ability to just pay for. Things that God is going to ask us that money's not the answer to. Problems that people have. That illustration with Kimberly. That woman didn't need money to solve the situation she had. She needed a word from God to tell her that there's no longer shame in her life. That God loves her. That breaks the power. That's worth so much more than just to be able to say, here's 20 bucks. You know, uh, I hope you feel better along the way contentment. Do you have a sense of contentment? Do you have a biblical sense of contentment? Do you have a confidence on the inside of you that regardless of what you're going to face in the future or what you're going through right now, God is sufficient. If everyone else leaves me and I've got God in my life, God is sufficient. Remember that story I told you a few weeks ago where when the gentleman from the Salvation Army first was when in India and because of sickness and, and trials that they had, that, that there was only four of them left, that they were about ready to enter into the, a major city to do a, a major campaign to reach a whole city, and, and there was only four of them. And the gentleman met them from the, uh, the authorities and said, you know, we thought there'd be a thousand of you to come and to do what you're doing. And the gentleman said, we are four and we have God. And he felt like that was enough. And I think that we need to restir on the inside of us that whatever we are facing or whatever God is calling us to do, regardless of whether there's four of us or there's one of us, we've got God and that's enough as we go forward. The sufficiency that's there, the confidence that's there, the boldness that stirs on the inside of us. That we, especially as Americans, don't fall back on thinking that wealth or finances is what's going to make things better that it's going to solve the problems along the way. Now, I'm not saying that money is bad. I'm not saying that money doesn't help in some areas. I'm just saying that we need to make sure that we realize that our sufficiency is in Christ, not in our cash as we go along. 
The reality is that true value and priority in our life needs to be viewed from the perspective of eternity. Not just the 40 year, or excuse me, 70 or 80 years that we live here on this earth. We accumulate so much here on this earth. We then try to maintain it for the life that we're here. And then it all gets left here behind us. But there are some things that God is going to ask of us to do that have eternity in them. Reaching the lost. Caring for people that are around us. The good deeds that we do reveal to us and to eternity the things that we should be doing and demonstrating his presence in our life. There should be a real value in our life of things that are eternal. And we put them in a place where we're trusting in God to make them come to pass. I thought it was interesting in Mark's gospel, chapter 4, where Jesus tells of the parable of the sower that sows the word, the eternal word of God, because God and his word are one. And when the sower sows the word, it's actually God saying, I'm giving the word and the word is me because there were one. uh, My word is as good as me being there. And the the word is sown out. And and in many of the places, the word went out, but it, it wasn't fruitful because it wasn't received. But one of those areas... He tells us in Mark's gospel, chapter 4, verse 19, it reveals the deceptiveness of wealth. Again, wealth in and of itself is not evil and it's not wrong. But if we're not careful, there's a deceptiveness to wealth. If I have enough, if I've got more, then I'm going to be okay. If I got enough money, then it's going to all work out. If I've got more than enough, then I'm set. But the reality is that there's problems that we come in against in life and there's problems that others have that we're going to encounter along the way that money is not going to be the answer to that. Listen to the words of Jesus. And I'm not just making this up. This is Jesus himself speaking to us. Mark's gospel chapter 4 verse 19. He says, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth. Isn't that interesting? The deceitfulness of wealth, not wealth but the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire of other things come in and choke the word. That's that eternal presence in our life, making it unfruitful. You see, these are considered weed seeds. Weeds grow faster than your vegetables in your garden because weeds aren't interested in producing fruit. They're not out there putting potatoes on the vine, uh, tomatoes on the vine, potatoes and tomatoes, depending on which way you go with the vine on that one. Uh, they're, not, they're not out there uh, putting the, the depth of the carrots into the ground and producing something. The weed is just growing to produce more seed to be able to, to push out more of it. And then they grow faster usually than the vegetables that are there to produce in our life. And we have to be careful, he says, because these three issues specifically, at, in then and now, will choke out the living word of God in our life. That's an eternal thing. God's word is an eternal promise. God watches over his word to perform it. God's word is that two-edged sword that comes out of us. The word of God is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. The, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I mean, we're talking about something very significant here. The word of God. But he says, these are three issues in this life, in this world, that can have a negative impact on the eternal word of God in our life. The worries in this life, the Bible says that we're supposed to do what with our worries? We're supposed to be a professional warrior, right? Take pride in our ability to worry. We worry better than anybody else. No, we're supposed to cast those worries over onto the Lord because he cares for us. We're supposed to give them to him because worrying doesn't affect anything. It actually uh, has a negative effect on us, but it has no positive effect. But so we cast them over on the Lord. Why? Because he's able to take care of it. And when I'm doing that, I have a sense of contentment. I have an inner confidence in the sufficiency of God. That I'm not going to worry about it because I can't do anything about it. I'm going to give it to someone who can do something about it. And I'm going to cast it over to him. The deceitfulness of riches. As I said, there's nothing wrong with wealth. But the fact is when we're deceived, if we think, more money will solve the problem along the way. You go and check with uh, people that have been, you know, won some of those mega millions. And and, and what are the first thing that most of them do when they win those mega millions? They don't tell anybody. They don't want anybody to know. Because they know as soon as the word gets out, 
your great uncle Freddie's brother's sister's aunt's uncle is going to come knocking at your door and, and tell you how much they, they, they loved you and you were your favorite and they've got a need in their life because, because the, the wealth all of a sudden brings along with it some things that are not so enjoyable along the way. But the deceitfulness is that we think that money will solve all life's problems. And it also says the desire for other things. You see, it's getting to the point here, desire. Where's your heart? There's a heart. Is our heart for the Lord? Is our heart desiring his, his word? Is, does our heart burn for, for the word of the Lord? Do we, do we, is, it, is the word of the Lord sweeter than honey in the honeycomb? Is the word of the Lord better than silver and gold? Is the word of the Lord that thing that you desire more than anything else in your life? Or is those other things start to come in and to choke out the word along the way? It's important for us to understand that wealth and riches aren't wrong. They're not evil unless they start to replace God in our life. And pastor, why are you saying this on Wednesday night? We're the, we're the best. We're the, we're the super Christians. We're, we're, we're the good ones. It's so you can use it for somebody else. It's not for you, of course, no. Because periodically, if you'll take the look, and I encourage you, if you have time uh, tonight or tomorrow, read, read at least chapter 6 uh, of 1, Peter, cha- excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 6, because Paul tells Timothy, you need to make sure that your people know this. And, and I would rather tell you this when all's going good in your life and you're, than when we, we're, we're messed up and we need corrected along the way. But I want to encourage us and remind us here, wealth and riches are not wrong. Uh, as I said, we're, we're one of the wealthiest nations in the world. And when I go on one of my ministry trips, uh, wealth is one of the gifts that I have to go with to help, to, to, to buy a cow for a widow so that her and her two daughters have, have uh, some kind of income, to be able to help dig a well for um, a, a pastor's family so that they have some water that they can draw from in the dry seasons when, uh, that they can, can water their vegetables and have something to drink along the way. Maybe to help build a church or uh, to do something along the way. Buy food for some pastors so that they can be some comfort for a time in their life. So there's nothing wrong with the wealth that we have. We just need to make sure that we're always having an inner sense of confidence in God's sufficiency. So I'm never, ever, ever tempted to trust in the money, but I'm always trusting in God and what he wants to do. Money is not the answer. Turn to your neighbor and say, money's not the answer. Tell him, money's, money's not the answer. Money's not the answer. It's not going to give you that peace that you think is going to last for forever in your life. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 is very familiar and oftentimes one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. I can still remember as a, as a teenager in a uh, factory that I worked in for a while and how they would say, money is the root of all evil. Well, you got part of the verse, but you need all of the verse to, to really get a hold of it. It's the love of money. It's when your heart is connected to the money instead of connected to the Lord in your life. And that's where it becomes a problem. It is when we start to desire the other things. It's the love of money. It's, if boy, if I just had some more. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Boy, if I just had some more. And then there's the question, how much is the more? How much is the more? Because most of us, after about 10 years, and we've maybe got some jobs, and maybe got some, some, uh, um, some income, and, and maybe we've got two incomes now, or, or some, most of us, we've got some more than we used to have. But it's still not, not enough along the way. But we can have a sufficiency when we have the Lord in our life because he's not only more, he's more than enough in our life. Amen? He's always more than enough. And it's okay to have more than enough when it's God is the one that's bringing the supply. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith. Why do we need to share verses like this? Why do we need to talk about wealth, money, riches? The love of money, because there is inside the deception of money the possibility that some have strayed from the faith because of money. How, how sad is that? How sad that some would, would drift from, from the faith and confidence in knowing Jesus Christ is their Savior. God himself who come to die for us 
God himself who would come and took on the form of a, of a, of a man so that he could be a servant and to die as for, our, for our sacrifice. And that we would, we would cash that in for, for the, the, the substitute uh, of wealth or the hope for money along the way. Some have strayed from the faith because of, this is an important issue, folks. This is something that we need to check our heart up periodically. And I'm not here, I'm not going to do a big altar call and, and ask you to, to give a big offering tonight to make sure that you're not connected with that cash, you know, get rid of that evil stuff, bring it in, you know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, let's check our heart. Let's check our heart. Lord, do I love you more than anything else? Am I desiring you more than any? Do I think about you more than the worrying of paying the bills? Do I think about you more than just trying, if I could win the lottery, then then things would all be great in my life. You see, when we stray from the faith, it says their greediness and has pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I don't want us to live that way, folks. I don't want us to have that contentment and that joy of knowing the Lord and his grace and his goodness in our life. And so as I was just, just trusting in God and, and, and praying about the service tonight and thinking about this, and I think, Lord, you know, these are, this is the best on Wednesday night. They don't need to hear this, but yet we need to be reminded of this along the way so that we keep that confidence in the Lord and the trust in Him. And it's not in a negative sense that I think any of us in here are, are not trusting in the Lord, that we don't have that confidence on the inside, but I just started to turn it around just a little bit and just to be reminded, money is not the problem, it's not the real issue, and it's also not the, really the answer in most people's lives as we go forward. I just started to think it, uh, in the Bible how people that were people of prayer had a whole different perspective where it came to, to trusting in the Lord and the finances along the way and how that they didn't allow money to be either a controlling force or a, 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 a hindering force along the way. Think of some of the situations in the Bible that money was not the answer for the people along the way. Uh, you go back to the Old Testament. Remember Naaman back in the Old Testament? He had leprosy. Leprosy. Leprosy in the, in the Bible was never a good thing. But uh, he, was, and he wasn't even, even a, a Jewish individual. He had leprosy. But yet he was a man that had uh, great accomplishments. And he was a man that had accumulated some level of wealth. But money couldn't heal him of leprosy along the way. But they told him about a prophet. A prophet of God. And the prophet of God was able to guide him into how to receive a miracle that not only stopped the leprosy, but gave him brand new skin in his body. What an incredible thing. No amount of money could do that. No amount of money could bring that to pass. I thought of Hannah in the Old Testament, a woman that wanted a child so bad. She wanted a child so bad, but she was barren. No amount of money could accomplish changing that barrenness changing that to give her a child in her life. She was so uh, uh, deep in prayer in the temple that the priest thought she was, was intoxicated because of the way she was praying in such intensity. Because you see, money wasn't going to solve her problems. But when she prayed and she trusted and had a, had a confidence in God and a contentment in his ability to move supernaturally in her life, she not only had a child, she had a child that grew up to be a major prophet in his day, uh, uh, Samuel the prophet that came from, from her. No, no amount of money can bring that thing to pass. I thought when Jesus told the disciples, we've got 5,000 men here and we've got a little boy's lunch, feed them. And the disciples said, we don't, have, you know, it's not so many words, but he said, we don't have enough money to be able to do this. Jesus basically said, I didn't tell you to go buy food for him. I told you to feed him. See, there's a different mindset here. If we are controlled by money, we limit what we think God can do. Jesus goes and offers up the prayer of thanksgiving. And I like this. It was, it was uh, I think, two weeks ago after uh, after service on Wednesday night, one of the kids came over from Kids Church, and I uh, asked him, I said, so what would you guys learn tonight? He said, we learned that, uh, that Jesus broke math. I said, you broke math, math, M-A-T-H, math. Jesus broke math. I said, you broke math. I thought, what in the world are they teaching those kids over there? <laughs> so I asked Zach afterwards, I said, Zach, the kid said, he, you guys broke math. Yeah. He said, we were talking about Jesus feeding the 5,000. 
He took the, the little few little loaves of bread and, 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 uh, and, got, and he multiplied them and he fed the 5,000 and they had more left over than they started with. You can't do that. He broke math when he was doing that. You see, no amount of money can take a little boy's lunch and can feed a multitude and have more left over than what you started with. And, and we've got to make sure that we don't ask the question first, how much is it going to cost? If God says do it, then we say, I've got confidence in God's sufficiency to be able to bring it to pass. And he's probably going to do it even above and beyond what I can think or imagine along the way. But if I'm controlled by cash, if I have a mindset of wealth instead of wisdom, then I'm going to limit what I think God can do along the way. I think of the woman who had the issue of blood, 12 years. She'd gone to all the doctors, tried all the remedies as possible, and she grew nothing better but was got well, worse. Spent all of the money that she had, the Bible says. But then she came to Jesus and said, if I touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. It had nothing to do with money. She had a problem that money couldn't solve, but, she had a, but when she trusted in Christ, it was able to be healed in her physical body. All of us have these kind of opportunities that are going to come up. I got to thinking Jesus told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. First, first thought can come to mind, do you know how much that's going to cost? If we go to how much is going to cost first, then we'll limit ourselves on what we do. I think it's interesting that Jesus told his disciples when they were on the earth to just uh, go out two by two, don't even take spare clothes with you. Jesus was not asking them to take a vow of poverty. He was ta- asking them to, ha- to have trust in God in his sufficiency. That wherever you, because you see, if you start off with nothing, you won't stop when you run out. But, but if, we, if we take some with us, when we run out, well, then that must be as far as I can go, and i got to go back. But if I didn't have anything to start with, and I got this far, I might as well keep going with the nothing that I had that got me this far along the way. And there needs to be a, a stirring on the inside of us, church, that we don't stop and ask ourselves, first of all, what's it going to cost God to do this? I don't know if I have that much money. I don't know if I can do that or not. Where we need to stop and be able to say, God, I have an inner confidence in your ability your sufficiency. You'll bring it to pass. You'll cause it to come to pass in my life. And we need to stir it up on the inside of us, folks, because there's a lot of individuals that we're going to start to come across, just like what Kimberly shared with. Individuals, you know, that uh, pulling a $20 bill out of your pocket is is not going to fix it. Uh, Paying their rent for the month might help them, but it's it's not really fixing what, what many of them have the need of. A final story here in, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. Tonight we're talking about when you're uh, full, but you still have that feeling of being empty. When you're full, but still have that feeling of being empty. Uh, I just want us to realize that, folks, as we're following after the Lord, we're going to come across people that, 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 that are going to need more than, than just natural things. They're going to need more than just physical things. And uh, God wants to get us to a place where we're not just looking to the natural to solve the problem, but we're looking to the supernatural. Uh, so much of the world today, we can see it, and we'll just, I'm not trying to be political, but in our, our country, just throw cash at it. Just print, go print some more, guys, and just throw cash at it, and that'll solve it. But it hasn't solved our problems. It hasn't solved the problems of our, of our why? Because our problems are not a, a lack of cash. Our, la- our problem is a lack of Christ in people's lives that need to touch, be touched by him supernaturally. Jesus had an illustration, an example to us here of an individual that, that had a problem that money was not going to be able to solve their, their life issue. Mark chapter 9, we'll start reading in verse 20 in just a moment here. Um, have you ever had a family problem that money wasn't going to solve? Have you ever had a, a, an issue in your life that just getting a lawyer wasn't going to solve it? Just getting a doctor wasn't going to solve it? Just getting after school teaching uh, wasn't going to solve it? Um, Getting counseling wasn't going to solve it. Jesus has been thrown into a situation here where a father comes up with a son who's demon-possessed. 
Money is not going to change this situation. Demons are not afraid of dollars, denarios or whatever they had back then. They respect the authority in the name of Jesus. And we as believers need to understand that when we minister to people, I'm all about doing good works. This church has done a lot and will continue to do a lot. We will continue to to give financially. We will continue to be a blessing. We'll do what we can. But in reality, if, we th- if that's all that we're doing, then we're really not doing much. Because the real issues in many people's lives goes beyond just throwing it. Let's be honest. Sometimes we've thrown some cash at them just so that it, it, it makes us feel better and, and, and we can go on. But here, the situation. Let's look at a John, Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, starting verse 20. And they brought the boy to Jesus. And when the demonic spirit saw Jesus, immediately it threw the boy into a convulsion. And fell to the ground, him being rolling around and foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked his father, how long has it been happening to him? And they said, since childhood. The demon has often thrown him into, both into the fire and into the water, intending to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. I think this is the voice of humanity right now. It's crying out to the church crying out to us as believers. If you can do anything, if you can do anything to help us, help us. We need supernatural help. This situation has been going on for too long. And there's nothing that anyone's been able to do. We need someone with divine authority to be able to do it. I'm not opposed to counseling, folks, but you don't counsel demons out of people. I'm not opposed to doctors, but you don't medicate demons out of people. I'm not opposed to, uh, to, to being kind and, and, and encouraging to people, but you, you don't talk a demon out of somebody. And demons are real. Demons are here. But we have the answer. When they come to ask for help, we need to be ready. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need to get ready. You, you need to get ready. Say it with an attitude. You, you need to get ready. You need to get ready. He comes to Jesus and says, if you can do anything, help us. Verse 23. Jesus says to him, you say to me, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes and trusts in me. Now, we're in this moment, we're looking and taking it in the scope of speaking to that father at this scripture. But here tonight, I'm taking that verse and I'm throwing it at us. I'm throwing it at us. Do we really believe? Do we really have If I could take that verse we started with and expand it this far, stretch it without taking it out of context, I believe. Do we really have an inner confidence in God's sufficiency that he could use someone like you and me to even deliver someone that has demonic influence in their life? It's incredible how still you got at that particular moment. It's incredible how paralyzed you got at that particular moment. The reality is there's a world out there saying, if you can do anything, help me. And the church is sitting here thinking, I'm not for sure, but I know somebody. I know somebody. The disciples said, I I know that when Jesus gets back, he'll be able to help you out. But I want you to know, I know somebody and it's you. You. You're going to be ready. You're going to be used. You've got to have that stirring on the inside of you. Jesus said, all things are possible to the one who believes and trusts in him. Let me, let me use this verse in reverse, and I'll just tell you, I'm backing you in something. Do you believe in Jesus? Can I say it? Can I hear it with a little bit more confidence? Like, I mean, we're talking, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe that with Jesus, all things are possible? Do you believe with all things are possible because you believe in Jesus, that you can do all things because you believe in Jesus. Uh, Yes, 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 yes. If I was to ask you, do you believe Jesus could do all things? Yes. But do you believe because of your faith in him that you can do all things when he calls you to it? We hesitate. 
verse goes on here, verse 24, and immediately the father of the boy cried out with a desperate, piercing cry, and I believe this is the voice of the church today. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I think this is all right for us to have a heart check tonight and just a little bit of sense of reality. We do believe. I know you believe. But there's still some unbelief that we need to overcome. There's some hesitation that's there. Part of the reason, if I could, again, marry this together, part of the hesitation is because we have become so comfortable about being able to reach into our wallet and say, how much do you need to be able to fix the problem? And then when we come to a problem that this won't fix it, there's a hesitation there. Because now it's not going to fix it with this. I've got to fix it with faith in him. That, that, that contentment on the inside, that regardless of what it is, whether it's one demon or if we are a thousand, it don't matter when we've got the name of Jesus to be able to, to minister in that particular point, in that matter. It doesn't matter whether it's been in a person for, for years or whether they just picked it up on the, on the way to church tonight. We have the authority in the name of Jesus to be able to operate. But if our confidence is in our cash, if we trust in our wealth to be able to solve life's problems of ours or those around us, then when we get in these situations where money's not the answer, then we hesitate and our unbelief paralyzes us at that particular moment. And so tonight what I'm asking of you and encouraging you to do is let's, let's break that limitation in our life. Let's stop asking what's it going to cost financially and let's just say with God all things are possible along the way. Let's start build that confidence on the inside of me that, that with Christ all, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. That we start to build this confidence on the inside that it's not my, my, my wealth, it's not my education, it's not even my, my ability to do good deeds or I've been a, a great super Christian along the way. It is Christ, the hope of glory that's in me that is going to shine through me and I have a, a confidence in God's sufficiency. That with God, all things are possible along the way. So Jesus goes and he, and, and, and he, and he answers in one sense the, the, the cry of this man. And, and if you could even tonight turn this into a prayer in your own life. Because I'm sure as great as, as your faith is, there's probably still some area of unbelief. Just turn to your neighbor and say, you're just not there yet. You're just not, you're not there yet. You've, you've still got a distance to go. You've got a little bit little ways to go. There's still some area of unbelief that we've got to get over. And we need to get over it. Please listen to me. We need to get over it before we get into one of these situations. We need to get over it before this, uh, someone comes up with a cry of desperation in their life. If you can do anything, help me. And we don't want to be like those other disciples. that Man, We tried, but nothing worked out. Know, boy, wait till somebody else comes along. No, we want to be at that moment. We say, I, tr I trust in God. I believe in his sufficiency. And I'm not, for my, first, my first response is not reaching for my wallet. My first response is that tug on my heart. I know God wants to work in this situation. I know God wants to do something here. Scripture goes on here in verse 25. And when Jesus saw the crowd was starting to rapidly gather around them, he rebuked the unclean spirit and said to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And screaming out with it, throwing him onto, uh, uh, into a terrible convulsion, it came out. And the boy looked as like he was a corpse so much uh, still and pale that many of the, uh, the spectators, may we never have a church of spectators, many of the spectators said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and he raised him up and he stood him up. What an incredible story. We read through that, but if we just go through it with our mind, we don't allow the Holy Spirit to really start to challenge our hearts. And tonight, folks, that's really what I'm asking of you. I don't care how much money you got. God's not impressed with how much you got. And God's not impressed with us when we're broke either. God didn't ask us to take a vow of poverty. And he doesn't say you got to have so much before you can get into heaven. He says, whatever you got, still trust in me. Whatever you got, still believe that I'm sufficient in your life. Can, can, I, can I trust you with, with a little or can I trust you with a lot? Can I trust you to be able to, to, to stay faithful to me uh, all along the way? Uh, 
and, and to be able to be used. Certainly, there's some areas that finances need to flow through us. But folks, God wants to trust us with a greater power than, than just wealth. He wants to trust us with the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through our lives that is able to reach and touch people's lives that money is not the answer to their problem along the way. That we'll never lack a confidence in his ability. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. You remember Jesus, he says this. Jesus looked at him intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but with God, everything is possible. Do we need to be reminded of that, folks? Everything is possible. When you look at your checkbook or your bank statement or your credit card statement and you might say, I can't do any more. But what we really need to say is, God, regardless of what I have, you can always do more in my life. I'm not asking you to give more. I'm asking you to trust God more. I'm not asking you to give everything you've got away. I'm asking you, regardless of what you got, trust God every single day for him to use you to reach out to people that are around you, that you don't allow wealth to limit you because no matter how much money you got, there's a limit to it. Amen? If you got kids, you tell them that on a regular basis. There's a limit. There's a limit along the way here. But when we trust in the Lord, there is no limit to what he can do and how he can do it what he wants to accomplish. One of the first miracles in the church, Peter and John are going to the gate beautiful and there's the lame man that's there. And those famous words where the lame man looks up expecting to receive, the Bible says, one translation, expecting to receive money from them. You see, money would help him, but money wasn't, the, wasn't gonna solve his problem. And, 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 and Peter says, Silver and gold have I none, or he's really basically saying is, that's not really going to solve your problem here, no matter how much I get, give you. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto you. He had a contentment. He had an inner confidence of God's sufficiency. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Not only, not only in the name of Jesus, reach down and grabbed him by the hand and pulled that lame man up. That's a confidence. That's a trust that needs to be built in our lives, folks, for the day that we're in. It's easy for us to take up offerings. It's harder to be the offering. To be able to say, Lord, I'm going to trust you to put me in places where people have needs that cash isn't going to take care of it, but that, you're gonna, that, that I'm going to have to trust your supernatural power to really meet the need that those people have. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your presence tonight. Thank you for stirring on the inside of us a biblical understanding of contentment. To understand that we entered this world with nothing and we will leave this world with, all, with none of the possessions that we have gathered here. But thank you for allowing us to be participants in the eternal things. Reaching the lost to see that they will be with you for eternity, caring for the things that you've called us to do and to be. We're asking for you to, to help us to have a revelation of what contentment really is. We're asking you, Father God, that you would speak to this group, that there would be an, an inner confidence in God's sufficiency, that whatever you call us to do, that we're gonna be quick to say, yes, Lord, Yes, Lord, and that we're going to trust in your ability to see it come to pass. Thank you for breaking math. Thank you for doing above and beyond what we can think or imagine. And thank you that we can continue to grow in our trust in you to see these things happen. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As you leave, just remember to go out into this world looking for those opportunities to help people in the real problems that they're facing. And the first thing we'll reach for is it's not our wallet. It's for the word of God to speak out and come out of our mouth boldly and in confidence in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Go out there and change this world and come back with testimonies about what the good God is going to do in and through your life.